uh, maybe uh, greetings to everybody, uh, grace and peace to, to all. And uh, good to hear the, it's good to hear the good news that uh, Singapore's doing well on controlling their cases. So that's, that's great. Um, I guess I should mention too, I'm not sure about next week. Next week, I am probably going to be Tuesday. I am with my brother's church. They have a little youth camping thing. And uh, I may be out in the woods somewhere. I'm not sure that I'll be able to, to zoom in from from where I am so uh, maybe I can update you on that but I'm not I'm not sure if that'll work or not anyway but we have today the Lord has given us and so we'll just take it, uh, one day at a time so why don't we pray and we'll have a little time of Bible study here so let's pray together Father thank you for today uh, we don't know what lies ahead we don't know we don't we don't even know we have tomorrow. But Lord, help us to end uh, today, to enjoy today, to enjoy you today, uh, to rejoice in you today, and to live and walk with you today. And so, Father, bless our time of study together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me begin by reading our passage, and let's get these words in our minds, and then we're going to focus in on one aspect of the, of the Christian armor. So our passage that we're working through is, uh, begins in verse 10 of Ephesians 6. This, of course, is the, really the last main section, other than the concluding comments, this is the last section in Paul's letter to the believers living in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. And he has just exhorted them the import of the importance of walking worthy of the calling which they have received. And I would take that calling as a calling to be really to be a part of the church as the body of Christ. And of course, that includes uh, salvation and all that God has prepared for them really beginning in eternity past and then calling him calling them to himself by faith and all the blessings and privileges that that involves and therefore they are to walk worthy of that calling and he comes to the end of his uh, of his letter and he wants to challenge them and so I, I have this I this, put this I as a war, war. in a war to walk to walk worthy and so this is what he, how he concludes, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And reminding us of our need of omnipotent strength if we are to walk worthy of our calling. And then he goes on taking our strength in the Lord, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. That, here's the purpose for putting on that armor, that she may be able to stand. This is a word that is going to be repeated. To stand against the wiles of the devil, the methods of the devil. For we wrestle not. Here's his reminder. As we walk worthy, it's not just a battle against other people or against even just uh, inanimate circumstances. Because we actually wrestle against flesh. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness that is in high places. And that's why really it's urgent, verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand, even in the evil day, even in the worst of spiritual conflict, you can stand if you will put on this armor. And I would take putting on the armor, the idea of living out the new man that we have in Christ Jesus. Verse 14 now is the third part of our passage. So first of all, being strong in the Lord, in his strength, put on that armor. 
Okay, put on that new man, that new man behavior. And then having put that on, now let's stand. Stand therefore, having, having put on the different pieces of this armor, having your loins girt about with truth. And as we talked about, I would take this as more the, the subjective idea of these terms based on the biblical usage of, of military or armor imagery. Uh, having your loins girt about with truth, being truthful like Paul had urged them to do in Ephesians 4, having on the breastplate of righteousness. And again, in, in uh, chapter 4, Paul had mentioned how they, had, um, they have a new man created in righteousness and the idea of putting on now that righteous behavior and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace or with the readiness that the gospel of peace brings. Above all, and here's the verse we're gonna be focusing on today, above all, taking the shield of faith. And I would again take this as our, our belief, our confidence in what God has said. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And I like to add the word one, the wicked one. This is referring to Satan specifically. And take the last couple pieces of the armor and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always, this is what you're to be doing the whole time. Praying always with all prayer and supplication and the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And I want to take us back. We've worked our way now through the first uh, three, uh, what we call the parts of the armor. We talked a little bit last time about uh, having our loins, having on the belt of truth. We talked about the breastplate of righteousness. We talked a little bit about the, our feet being shod with the preparation, the, 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 the readiness for conflict that the gospel of peace uh, brings into our lives. And I want to talk now about this idea of the, the shield of faith and the importance of our, as we prepare to stand in the battle, to take to ourselves this shield of faith. Let me just put a question here in the chat. Um, how important uh, is our faith in what God has said? How important is that in our lives as Christians? How central is that to our standing victorious even in the evil day? And I would like to suggest to us that our faith is really central to every aspect of our Christian life. And one of the reasons I say that is because of what for how verse 16 starts. It starts by saying, above all. And I think that suggests to us, it, it could you can take that a couple of different ways, but I think what it is obviously suggesting is that this idea of taking up the shield of faith is extremely uh, central to our standing victorious. Uh, I mentioned uh, in the book, and I'm looking at page 83, if you have a copy of the book, this is chapter nine, uh, Shield of Faith. But the idea that you could either take this as in all or, or above all, and some will even take this as, as the idea of in every circumstance, taking to you the shield of faith. And I would say, regardless of how we, where exactly we nail down how to translate this, that really is the idea that we need to take up faith in every aspect, in every circumstance of our Christian life. And I think one of the reasons for that is that faith really is taking to heart what God has revealed or what God has said. And our Christian life is really totally one of faith, 
but we are living on the basis of what God has said. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so there is a word of God for essentially every area of our life. And faith is taking to ourself what God has revealed in every area of our life. And so faith is extremely central to our being victorious in the Christian life, because really our life is, is based, our life as a Christian is based on what God has said. And we've got to believe that what he has said is true. And in the end, it is going to, it's going to pay, or in the end, we are not going to be ashamed. We're going to get more to that a little bit later. Well, what about when does faith begin? Or um, as we think about how central faith is in our lives, and I want to bring out this point, and that is that really faith is so central to our life as Christians that really it is, it is a part of our life from the moment that we are born again until the moment of our death and when our body and our spirit or our soul are separated. Um, you think about, okay, what is, the, what is the response that brings a man or a woman into the kingdom of God? The answer is faith. And even the book of Ephesians brings that out. For by grace, are you what? Are you saved through, through faith? That's the, that's the starting response to the gospel that even brings a person into the family of God, into the body of Christ. And Paul will bring up that response even earlier uh, in this book of Ephesians. You could go all the way back to verse one, I mean, I'm sorry, chapter one, verse 13, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. Uh, verse 13, a little bit later on, in whom also after that ye believed. And so really our Christian life starts with faith. Um, we live by faith until the moment that our faith becomes sight. And in some ways, faith is one of the twin characteristics that describes every, every believer. Uh, and you can see this even a little bit later in chapter one, verse 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. And if you think about it, in some ways, the two defining characteristics of a Christian is that is their faith and their love, their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love their love for other Christians, their love for God. In some way, those are the two of the defining characteristics of what it means to be a Christian person. And so this, uh, the importance of faith uh, is really from the beginning, we really, uh, from faith to faith, and, and the faith we start with then grows, and we grow from that initial faith to an even more mature faith. And really, if you think about it, your entire Christian life, God is refining your faith. Uh, this is this is uh, part of what First Peter says, right? That the the trying of your faith or the proving of your faith that is more precious than gold. Genuine faith is more valuable than gold, and God is at work our entire Christian life, polishing the gold of our faith. And so faith is uh, faith is is very central, and it's really with us from the beginning of our Christian life really to the, the moment of death when faith becomes sight. And of course, what that also means is that faith is absolutely necessary in order to please God. We could infer that from various passages in the book of Ephesians. We are to believe um, uh, Paul hears of their faith and love. But of course, you've got Hebrews eleven six, 6, which says that explicitly. It is impossible to please God without faith. Because really, everything in our Christian life is, again, to be one, one of faith. Uh, uh, if it is not, Paul tells us in another letter of his, if it is not of faith, it is sin. And in some ways, the actions we carry out as believing people, as Christians, 
Christian people. They really ought to be because of what we believe is true. Based on what I believe is true, I will act in a certain way today. Based on what I believe is true, I will treat my children in a certain way. Based on what I believe is true, I will respond to fearful circumstances in a certain way. Based on what I believe is true, I will not watch certain things today, or I will not listen to certain things today. Based on what I believe is true, I will make certain choices with my finances today. I mean, really, our entire life is to be one of faith. And uh, I love, um, in the book I've mentioned before to you, the book, The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. And uh, he brings out this idea of uh, we need uh, we need to take God's word we need to read it. We need to pull out principles. Based on those principles, we need to form convictions that will define our behavior. And then we need to be committed to those convictions. That really is a life of faith. Faith is not just some ethereal, abstract, mystical quality that's somehow, you know, far out there that was a characteristic of people like J. Hudson Taylor. But this is, this is everyday behavior in the Christian life, that I live on the basis of what God has revealed. So without faith, it is impossible to please God. And of course, Hebrews 11 is full of examples of people who lived that way. And because of their faith, they made certain choices. Abel made because of his faith, made a certain choice with regard to a sacrifice that Cain did not make. Uh, Noah, because of his faith, made a choice to build an ark. Uh, Abraham, because of his faith, made a choice to follow God to a country that he didn't even know where it was. Uh, and it goes on and on in that chapter. And I think one of the great examples is Moses. I mean, Moses turns his back on the life in an Egyptian palace because he believes that following God will pay better than living in an Egyptian palace. That's faith. And faith believes that it pays to do things God's way, meaning to live a life based on God's word. That's faith. And that's the kind of, that's the characteristic, the virtue we need in order to please God. Another point that I bring out in the book is we talk about the shield of faith and above all taking the shield of faith. And let's not think of this as just a one-time act. This is something that we have to do repeatedly. And I, I see this even in Hebrews 11 and the life of Moses, where, okay, Moses exercises faith not to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But if you, if you read in Hebrews 11, he's got several verses that are related to his life. Why? Because his life was, was punctuated by various faith decisions. It began, so to speak, with his making a decision uh, uh, not, to, not to live in Egyptian palace. But then he forsakes Egypt. That's another faith decision, verse 27 of Hebrews 11. Um, he institutes the Passover. That's another faith decision, Hebrews 11 tells us. Um, then he crosses the Red Sea with Israel. Verse 29 of Hebrews 11. That's another faith decision, Hebrews 11 tells us. In other words, he really is living from faith to faith. He's making repeated faith decisions. And I think we can draw from that this idea that you may, you may launch out uh, in a on a pathway of faith. That's just the beginning. That's not the end. It's not a one-time act. And uh, I think, you know, for me, sometimes what I think back to is, my decision uh, when I was first year at Bob Jones University, when I heard Dr. Bob Jones Jr. preach, and I responded really with an act of surrender, like, Lord, okay, you're Lord and whatever you want. And in some way, that was a faith decision. I said, okay, God, I'm, whatever you want, that's what I'm going to do. But, you know, that's not the end of my, my faith. Um, it, takes, it takes faith to keep going down that pathway, to keep making faith decisions, to keep trusting God day by day, to keep trying to live out uh, my convictions. Um, this it takes repeated, uh, repeated actions. And 
really, as you think about it, faith is under satanic attack. Uh, faith is so central and faith is so important that this is what Satan attacks. And we ought not to be surprised if we feel like our faith is weak or we have doubts. And you may say, oh, what do I do? I have doubts. Well, well, why do you have doubts? Who do you think is attacking your faith? If faith is so central to the life of a Christian person, of course Satan is going to attack your faith. And if you think about it, that is exactly what he began. That's where he launched his attacks from the very beginning. And think again about the verse. I'll go back to Genesis, but think again about the verse in Ephesians uh, Ephesians 6, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. What do you think Satan is shooting at? Number one, it mentions Satan himself, the wicked one. So Satan himself is doing this. Um, he is he's shooting these fiery darts at our faith. That's why we got to lift up the shield of faith, because what Satan is attacking is our belief and our confidence in what God has said. And again, this is because faith is so central. This is what he attacked in Genesis. This is what he attacked with Eve when he comes to her and he says, is this really what God has said? What is he doing? He's throwing a dart at the words of God, and he's making her think twice or second guess what God has said. And you think about how he's doing that today, right? You think about how many times in your own mind you will second guess something that God has said. Where is that coming from? I'm just saying that, that you know, when you think, oh, I, I have doubts and I'm not sure what to think of. I mean, why, why do I have doubts? Well, listen, because your faith is under attack. Because what God wants, because what Satan wants to do is he wants to make you doubt what God has said, just like what he did in some of the very first questions in the Bible. When he says, is this really what God says? And he asks, he asks it in a way that casts doubt on the character of God, on the goodness of God, on, on whether God is being overly selfish or overly egotistical. He's attacking the character of God. And that's what he's doing. And so I just, I want to say that because I, I want to encourage us if you feel like, well, I don't understand, you know, why I, I sometimes have doubts. Listen, you're in a battle. We know we're in a spiritual battle. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. And to be honest with you, one of the things that is directly under attack, the fiery darts of the wicked one, they are aimed at what God has said and making you question what God has said. And, uh, and you see this all around you, right? I mean, this is what you get if you watch the news. Uh, and you they talk about, oh, we just found the new missing link to the whole scheme of evolution, you know? Okay. Here comes doubt. Well, you know, what if they did? What if we've been around here for millions of years? Uh, what if the earth is truly millions and billions of years old? Um, or, you know, maybe you're, you're watching the news and it goes to the lives of the rich and famous. And you think, wow, you know, this life really is what it's all about. You know, oh, that I could live like that. You know, oh, that I could uh, have that kind of money. Oh, that I could have that kind of a lifestyle. You know, here come the doubts as to whether it's really worthwhile living by faith, living for a world that's future and invisible. Okay, so I mean, everything around us um, and even, even the world in which we live now, um, is, is it a good God that has allowed a pandemic to shut down the whole world? Um, what, you know, how can you trust a God who has allowed your own father to die in a pandemic. And I can think of somebody I know who has relatives and young children who lost a father in this pandemic. Uh, another one of my students years ago, um, her father is currently basically beyond human hope on a ventilator uh, in a hospital um, dying. Um, you know, why would a good God allow that to happen? I mean, these are the kinds of fiery darts that are attacking 
Did, is God really good? Is God really in control? Does he really know what he's doing? And you want to think of this as a spiritual, as a spiritual battle. Faith is under attack. And that is why, as First Peter says, we have to resist Satan firm in your faith. First Peter 5, 8 and 9. Resist him firm in your faith. And don't allow the seeming contradiction between your present difficult circumstances and what God has said to dim the reality of the God who says to you in 1 Peter 5.10, he will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you after you have suffered a while. What's happening to you is exactly what God has said. When somebody comes and says, well, listen, why is there, you know, why is there so much suffering? in this world? Why is there so many problems? That's exactly what God said. This is not outside of the scope of God's revelation to us. That's exactly what he said would happen. Actually, things are unfolding exactly according um, to what God has revealed. Um, he has called us to eternal glory. Uh, as Peter says, he is using suffering. This is the trying of your faith so that your faith is polished, so that your faith is sure so that your faith is genuine and and so faith really believes god against all odds and you know there have been many a time many times in god's providence that uh somebody's circumstances immediate circumstances don't seem to match up with what god has said i mean look at abraham you know, who God says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. <laughs> and uh, Abram has a barren wife. Well, how's that going to happen? Uh, he waits 25 years. Uh, or you think of Joseph, who has these dreams. You know, those dreams that Joseph had when he was 17, those dreams were divine revelation. Those were given to him by God. Here are dreams that say, okay, your brothers are going to bow down to you. In fact, not just your brothers, your whole family is going to bow down to you. And then he's sold into slavery. And for 22 years, he has no idea how that is going to be fulfilled. How in the world is that going to happen when he's a slave in Egypt? That seems impossible. But those dreams were given to him as divine revelation to help him really to, to settle and establish his faith. Okay, this is what God has said. Are you gonna believe what God has said even when circumstances are absolutely contradictory to what God has said? And, um, you know, I think part of the reason you say, well, why, why does God do that? You know, why does God make us wait? Or why are circumstances opposite to, to, the, to the promises sometimes? And I think one of the answers is that God wants us to walk with him while we wait on the promise. And, you know, if there was immediate, if there was immediate, um, if, if there was an immediate, uh, every time there was immediate uh, kickback, I can't think of the right word here, but, you know, if every time uh, there was a promise, there was an immediate kickback, kickback, um, it would almost be like God is a divine vending machine, you know, where you put in your money and out comes your snack or out comes your bottle of water or out comes your soda. And it'd be like, God is this cosmic vending machine. And I just punch a button. I put in the right formula. I punch a button and out comes the promise. Well, where's the walking with God in that? And I think God wants us to love him more than we love the promises. And God is not just a vending machine that we come to to get what we want. God wants us to walk with him while we wait on those promises. And it's like one theologian said, God does not want those promises to acquire an importance and, of, and value apart from God himself. And so by having us wait, I mean, think of how Abraham had to walk with God while he waited for the promise. Think of how Joseph needed to walk with God while he waited for the promise. And you think of the number of times where it says of Joseph, but God was with him. But God was with him. Why do you think God was with Joseph? 
in part because Joseph was making choices to be with God. He was walking with God and God was with him. And in the circumstances of life that sometimes we can't understand, we need to walk with God in the midst of those circumstances while we wait on the promises. And the promises are the food for the journey as we walk with God. And, um, you know, God wants our faith in him to move us to do things for him. And it's part of what Hebrews 11 is about. Hebrews 11 is full of examples of people who acted in certain ways because they believed certain things. It's like, it's like Paul who quotes one of the Psalms, Psalm, Psalm 116. He said, uh, he says, uh, I believed, therefore I speak. <laughs> you know, Paul says, we believe, therefore we speak. I mean, we could, I think we could say this, we believe, therefore we act. And you've got all these actions in, in Hebrews 11. And there's a list of things like, uh, by faith, they conquered kingdoms. By faith, they performed acts of righteousness. By faith, they obtained promises. By faith, they shut the mouths of lions. By faith, they quenched the power of fire. By faith, they escaped the edge of the sword. By faith, from weakness, they were made strong. By faith, they became mighty in war. By faith, they put foreign armies to flight. King James uses the word aliens. These were actions of faith. And you know, I think we could ask ourselves, what has your faith moved you to do? And you may say, well, you know, look at this list, you know, shut the mouths of lions. That's Daniel, right? Quench the power of fire. That's the three Hebrews. Uh, escape the edge of the sword, uh, put foreign armies to flight. You think, well, I haven't done any of that. But you know, there are other important actions of faith that you do every day. You know, when, when you choose uh, to try, to, uh, to, try to, to, to have a work schedule where you honor the Lord's day, um, that is a faith decision. You know, there are people who, uh, it takes a lot of faith to not work on, on the Lord's day. Uh, I know, uh, knew of a family in the Philippines, they had a fish market and um, remember being in their home many times and uh, they made a decision, even though uh, the best, the best market day of the week was Sunday, you could sell the most fish on Sunday. Um, their conviction before God was they closed their fish stall on the Lord's day so that they could be in church. You know, for him, that was a faith decision. These are not rich people. Um, you know, there may be some of you, your faith decision is you've decided that you will not enter into any kind of a romantic relationship with somebody who is not a believer. That is a faith decision. And some of you are watching the days and the weeks and the months and the years tick by and you wonder, where is, where is Miss Wright? Where is Mr. Wright? <laughs> and, and, you know, there could be options for you. Um, but because of your faith, you're saying, okay, by faith, because this is what God has said, I'm not going to enter into any kind of a romantic relationship with somebody who is not a believer. Or there could be some of you because of what you know God has said about keeping yourself pure uh, before marriage. And you may say, okay, my faith decision is that, you know, I, I've, I've got a, I have a fiance, uh, I'm in a serious relationship with somebody who's a good Christian person. And um, my faith is that we are going to keep that relationship pure. And we're not going to do something that is going to, uh, going to defraud one another or is going to cross the line and make that relationship impure before a holy God. That's a faith decision. Or there may be some of you that are in a business and you have opportunities to cheat or to be unethical or to, to slide some income under the table or to be involved in shady business deals. And you say, well, you know, um, I could make a lot more money. <laughs> if I were a little bit dishonest, I could make a lot more money. I could give more money to church <laughs> if I were a little bit dishonest. But you say, well, you know, my faith is that I believe it honors God uh, for me to run my business honestly. And that's what I'm going to do. And so really, there are things that your faith moves you to do on an everyday basis. And 
take courage when, when by God's grace, uh, you, you know, you find yourself living out your faith. Uh, maybe it's just working hard. You know, it's God's will for you as a servant, uh, as an employee to work hard. Um, and other people around you take a lot of breaks. They drink a lot of tea. <laughs> um, they're on their phone a lot. But you work. You're at your machine. You're at your desk. You're in your chair. You're at your computer. You're doing work. You're not doing uh, social media on company time. Listen, that's part of your living out your faith before a watching world. Um, all of this is is part of what it means to live by by faith. And I wanna I wanna close with a verse. And I this this verse really hit me several weeks ago. This is uh, this is Acts chapter twenty five. I'm sorry, 27, 27, 25, um, but Acts, Acts 27, and uh, this is uh, this is a long chapter uh, in Acts. Uh, this this is a shipwreck, and it's like, what value can Paul's shipwreck have for me? Uh, and I, I think probably there's there are many, obviously, uh, all scriptures profitable, but I love this verse in verse 25. Okay, so you got to kind of picture this scene. Okay, just kind of, here's Paul uh, on the ship, uh, tossing uh, uh, in the waves, in the wind. Um, he's on this ship in the providence of God. He had, remember, he appealed to Caesar. Uh, they sent him to Caesar. They got him on a ship. And they got him on a, then he's on a different ship. Uh, they're sailing past the time when it's really good to be sailing. Uh, he actually told them that, right? I mean, he told them it really isn't a good idea for you to keep trying to sail. They didn't listen to him. They wanted a better place to, to harbor for the winter. So they kept going in spite of what he said. Uh, sure enough, they took off. The wind came up, blew them off of land. Now they're out of control. They're just drifting at the mercy of the winds. Um, things are in very bad shape. And verse 21, Paul, the man of faith, stands up. And in verse 21, he says, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me. <laughs> That's the closest thing you'll see to, I told you so. <laughs> you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you, verse 22. Now, this, this is in the middle of the Aegean Sea, or the, I should say the Mediterranean Sea. This is in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea with the wind blowing and the waves tossing and a ship out of control. And it's been that way for days. And he says, I exhort you to be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. How does Paul know that? How can he say that so confidently? Verse 23, for there stood by me this night, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, so these are words of God, fear not Paul, Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So here's something God said. Here's something God said to Paul. Paul is now declaring it. He is saying it to all of his fellow shipmates. He's saying to them, "Be of good cheer. Nobody's going to lose their life. The ship's going to be lost. Nobody's going to lose their life." Why can he, why does he say that so confidently? Verse 25, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. And here's the phrase that just struck me one day. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. And the reason Paul stands up and speaks like he does and says, listen, folks, listen, men, be of good cheer. 
The reason he says that is not just because God said something, but because he believed what God said. And you can see that in between the confidence that a person can have in what lies in the future, and in between that and what God has said is your faith. That's the shield of faith. That's Paul lifting up the shield of faith. In the midst of a a literal storm, he says, listen, God said to me certain things, and guess what? I believe that it's going to turn out exactly as, as God said. Again, verse 25, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Here's a question for us. Do we believe that it's going to turn out exactly as God, exactly as God has said? About everything. Where we can say, okay, I believe God that it's going to turn out exactly like as like 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 he said like what he told me that's exactly what's going to happen you say well but you know it's so messy right now <laughs> um, it's so messy in our world it's so messy in my world it's so messy in my life well look at verse 26 how be it we must be cast upon a certain island <laughs> he says, okay, listen, folks, nobody's going to die. God told me this. I believe it's going to turn out exactly what God said. But um, we must be cast on a certain island. <laughs> you know, you know, it's going to get messier. It's going to get a little worse before it gets better. But the end, but I know what the end is going to be. You know, and that's exactly where we are, isn't it? I mean, it's messy in the middle. And you say, you know, there are details in my life I don't understand. Okay, you know, we're going to be cast on an island sometimes. There's going to be some shipwreck. There's going to be some problems. There's going to be some suffering. There's going to be some circumstances that don't seem to entirely match up. But we've read the end of the book, right? We know the end of the story. We know what God has said. So I believe God that it's going to turn out exactly like he said. And yeah, you know, there's, it's going to get messy. <laughs> um, in fact, it might get a little bit messier. But we know the end. And uh, I love the way Paul says that, you know, how be it, we're going to be cast on an island. <laughs> you know, things are going to get bad. Um, we're going to lose the ship. But not a single one of you is going to be lost. Because he knows the end, because God told him the end. You know, and in many ways, God has told us the end. God has told us. It has been revealed. We know the end of the story. We know that in the end, Jesus is the victor. We know at the end that there is a reward for all his saints. We know that in the end, he's going to come back. We know that in the end, he's going to come back actually with his mighty angels. He's going to bring comfort and rest, 2 Thessalonians 1, to those who believe in him. And he's going to bring judgment on those who refuse to obey our gospel. That is what God has revealed. Now, do we believe that enough to live a life of courage and good cheer and good hope because we've lifted up the shield of faith And we've said, like Paul says in verse 25 of Acts 27, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. That really is what it means to lift up the shield of faith. That's what you and I've got to do every day of our Christian life. And of course, again, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You've got to keep We, we have got to keep the word of God before us. And as we read it and think about it and meditate on it and memorize it, we've got to put our trust in those words. So may God help us uh, to be people that lift up the shield of faith. So I hope that'll be an encouragement 
to us uh, to, as we live in a kind of a messy world. Uh, we're, we're in the messy middle. And, uh, but we know it's going to turn out exactly like God said. Any thoughts, any, any words that might be of help to us as God's people? Thank you for the message, Dr. Barry. Uh, do you feel that when you speak, the whole sc screen is shaking, so it must be a very powerful, strong message you are speaking? <laughs> you know what? I apologize. Um, it's because I'm holding my laptop on my lap <laughs> instead of on a surface. I didn't think about that. So every time I'm making a point, right? I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. The whole place is <laughs> like the earthquake like that. So, uh, but I, yeah, I didn't think about that. I, would, I thought it'd be better if it was closer to me. And uh, I don't have a good table desk surface here where I am yeah. in Wisconsin. So I apologize. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, it, Some may be having sea sickness, motion sickness. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that. All right, Dr. Yeah. Barry, uh, I, I, I hope after my question, some other people will, can ask some question or contribute something. Briefly, uh, I'd like to know what will strengthen our faith or what will weaken our faith? Well, I guess, um, not to sound simplistic, but I think uh, it just all goes back to our intake of scripture and keeping the word of God before us. And I think praying, praying for illumination and asking God to give us insight into his word and then reading scripture. And um, I even just practically the last few days, we, as a family, we were doing some about one hour trips uh, of travel. And uh, we started um, just, we did this just a, a couple times uh, but we would, as we read, as we traveled, we would read an entire book of scripture, like First uh, Timothy or Second Timothy. We'd read a chapter, and then we'd talk about it. We'd read a second chapter. We'd talk about it. And, um, you know, I just found that to be very strengthening to me personally in a time when I really needed that. And it just reminded me of how important it is that we keep the word of God in front of us. And I would, I know some of you, um, some of you have the word of God in your, in your car. Like you'll, you get in your car and the Bible will come on. And uh, I would say that's, that's a great thing to do. That's a great faith strengthener, strengthener. Um, and I would say, do something like that. Like um, listen to a chapter and rather than just listen to that, just listen to it without pause, like listen to a chapter, then put it on pause and then talk to the Lord about that chapter. And say, okay, Lord, you know, what about this? And just kind of talk through that chapter with him. And then listen to another chapter. Say, okay, Lord, now, you know, you mentioned this. Okay, how can I apply this? And, uh, and really finding nourishment. So I really, I mean, I, I, as you all know, um, you know, the, the intake of God's word is what really strengthens our faith. And I think the contrast, what really weakens our faith is what you have in, in Psalm 1, where you have the contrast between the blessed man who takes his cues from the word of God. He delights in the law of God. He meditates on it. That's where he's getting, that's where he's getting his cues for life. And that's so different from the person who, who stands in the way of sinners, who sits in the seat of the scornful. And I would say that what weakens our faith is when we feed, we feed on sinful culture. We feed on what our sinful culture is telling us. And I would say that is what weakens our faith. That is what brings a lot of doubt. You know, when you, maybe when you, you, you watch things you shouldn't, that lift up eyes, let's say, that lift up ideas of romance that we know are contrary to what God has said. Or maybe we, we feed on, um, you know, it can be uh, things related to evolution that erase God from the origins of human life. Um, so, you know, and obviously sometimes in studies, maybe in, in college studies, you've got to deal with some of that. But I mean, that is what weakens your faith. I think sometimes that's why you, 
you can see college age students who come away shaken in faith. Well, why is that? Because they stood in the way of sinners. They sat in the seat of the scornful. And if you're not, if you're not balancing that with a, a heavy dose of scripture, uh, you could very well go that pathway because it will attack your faith. So I think just being, you know, realizing what is it in my life that attacks my faith. So I think being very careful that, um, uh, you know, Psalm 1 Christianity. It's a good question. Any comments, uh, any questions? You can just uh, type out. Dr. Barry, uh, sometime when we do devotions in the morning, uh, do we then say that we complete our devotions and uh, are we able to like continue in our day, the whole day, uh, consider done our devotion? Will that be sufficient? Well, um, I think um, I think what's important is we is we take what we have read or what we've devoted ourselves on, and we try to carry that into our day. And um, there's a kind of a mental digestion. So just like the food that you take in in the morning strengthens you, because your body is your body is digesting that. And I think in the same way, what we take in in the morning, digesting during our day and allowing it to strengthen us in our minds as we have opportunity. And uh, so I, um, I think you've heard me say how, what you wanna do is you wanna turn your Bible reading into fellowship with God. And when God talks to you about you then talk back to God about that. And then that becomes the food for your journey that day. And many, many times I've seen how what God has given me in the morning, that really is what I needed for that day. So, yeah. so in his law, doth he meditate day and night? And I think the idea of day and night there is the idea of basically all the time or whenever possible mm. so it's you know you're you're taking in the word of god at all times whenever possible <laughs>